Hi, everybody. My name is Zach Serber. Um, I'm here basically to present to you some updates on the insect communities that we observed in CBD hemp uh, in Indiana during this last season, so during, uh, during 2021. So during the summer of 2021, uh, we scouted hemp at three sites in northern Indiana, the Purdue Migs Research Farm, the Purdue Student Farm, and a collaborating growers farm. Now these are our primary, our primary objective was to characterize the seasonality of insects, of insect observations through the 2021 growing season. And these sites did differ a little bit uh, from each other. Uh, the, the Migs Research Farm, uh, at the Migs Research Farm, sorry, hemp was grown uh, with cover crops in between each row. At the student farm, hemp was grown in a high tunnel. And then at the collaborating growers farm, the hemp is a conventional farm with hemp grown, bordered by essentially corn on three sides. A scouting was done every two weeks from June, from June 18th to August 31st, and was done uh, systematically using two transects that kind of formed an X uh, through the plots. So to give you a little bit more context, uh, plants were transplanted into the fields uh, uh, on June, around June 7th, when they were around four weeks old. And sites were typically scouted between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m., although we usually started at nine because we were trying to beat the heat. Uh, and over the course of this three-month period, we scouted 20 varieties of hemp over th across three sites. So what did we find? We observed a, a wide diversity of insects uh, across our sites, and almost 1,500 insects were observed. Uh, just to name a few, you know, we observed lady beetles and caterpillars and spiders, though spiders aren't insects, uh, stink bugs, mantids, and grasshoppers, just a, a very wide variety of things. So seasonally, how this breaks down is in June, we had our lowest number of insect observations, and then that peaked in July and kind of declined to sort of a middling level in August. Now, this doesn't mean that you only need to scout for insects in, in July. There's an old saying that the best way to manage a pest problem is not to have one in the first place. And the best way to do that is to scout frequently. Uh, scouting in June and early in the season is necessary because not only is this when plants are at their most vulnerable, the insects that you see in June may be indicative of what you might see through the season. Uh, and of course, the same is true for, for late season scouting. Uh, you do want to be vigilant later in the season, even if you're going to be harvesting, you know, late August, maybe mid-September, uh, because you don't want to get hit with a late season pest outbreak. So to categorize the insects that we observed, we put them into three groups, potential pests, predators, and likely visitors. Now, potential pests, we call them potential because we're not 100% sure if they're actually causing economic damage to your plants. Uh, but these are herbivorous insects that that do feed that have been observed feeding on your plants, and they have the potential to cause to, to cause economic damage. Now, predatory insects are relatively self-explanatory. These are insects that feed on other insects or parasitize other insects or feed on insect eggs. Uh, that's self kind of self-explanatory. Now, likely visitors is a group that we defined as insects that are providing neither a benefit nor a harm to your plants. So these are things like fruit flies and house flies and mosquitoes. And uh, in the case of CBD, have actually pollinators can also kind of be considered visitors because in an all female uh, field, uh, they're not really providing any benefit or service to the plants themselves. Now, in terms of potential pests, a lot of insects can feed on your plants. Uh, I've outlined the ones that we have observed most often here. Uh, and these are cannabis aphids, white flies, leaf hoppers, uh, redheaded flea beetles, and grasshoppers. Now, the three prior are uh, piercing sucking insects, meaning that they feed on the juices inside of your plants. So damage may not be as obvious as it is with like a flea beetle or, you know, a chewing grasshopper, but we'll get into the signs and symptoms of damage in a, in a moment. Now, these three insects alongside things like mites uh, are of primary concern if you're growing indoors. These are things that can get into your greenhouses and they're very, they can be very difficult to remove once they're inside. Um, and it's important also if you're growing transplants, if you're transplanting from indoor production to outdoor production, it's important to, to examine your plants for these sorts of insects before you transplant them into the field because you don't wanna be spending a whole bunch of time and effort fostering plants that were infested with insects from the get-go. 
Now, of course, other potential pests include things like caterpillars and tarnished plant bugs. Um, but uh, let's talk a little bit about how we can break this group down. So in terms of the insects that we observe most often, white flies, aphids, and leafhoppers make up 60, I think a little bit more than 60% of all of the potential pests that we observe at this site. And these were followed by grasshoppers and caterpillars and plant bugs and things like that. But these three groups, white flies, aphids, and leafhoppers, really made up the majority of the potential pests that we observe. Now, seasonally, these, these insects kind of exhibit a similar pattern as to what we've, what we've observed overall. So overall, you know, we have our, our kind of lowest numbers of observations in June with peaks, especially in our large, in our most commonly observed groups uh, in July, followed by kind of a, a decline in August, at least of these three groups. Now, there are some late season insects insects that were more prevalent late season than there were than they were early season. And these include things like, for example, if you look right here at stink bugs, these were completely absent in June and become more prevalent as we move from July to August. Um, well, I should say are more commonly observed as we move from July to August. The same can be said with uh, plant bugs. So things like tarnished plant bugs and honestly, um, even, uh, well, no, so yeah. Plant bugs and honestly, even grasshoppers increased slightly through the season. Now, this goes to show that the there is variation in the insects that you will see at different points in the season. Um, but you're not always going to see the insects that are causing you damage. So it's important to be able to identify the signs and symptoms of damage. And I've outlined a few here. So this in the top left, this is honeydew. So this glossy kind of coating on the top side of the leaf, that's honeydew, which is essentially sugar water that's excreted by things like aphids and white flies and leafhoppers. So the three groups that we observe most common, most often. Now, this can this honeydew in itself, it, it's sticky and it's sugar water and it can foster the, the growth of mold. So you can see here, this is a little bit of sooty mold. Uh, and if you leave this completely unchecked or if it gets very I won't say leave it unchecked. If you if this gets very severe, it can look like this, where the entire leaf is covered in mold. And this can be a really big problem because this mold interferes with the plant's ability to absorb sunlight and, and may and sorry, and may uh, interfere with growth. Now, chewing damage is pretty obvious, is pretty self-explanatory. If you see plants, insects that look like this, you know. You see holes in the leaves, you see bits of leaves missing, you see, you know, obvious signs of chewing damage, you know, uh, maybe, maybe you, you might even see like an entire leaf that's just missing, you know, you only see these like the end of it. Um, in this case, it's important for you when you see this sort of damage to, um, right, to, to look around, look at the plant you're finding this on, look at nearby plants, try to find a likely culprit, because like as it is right now, we have this photo of chewing damage, but we're not exactly sure what caused this. It's important as a result, we wouldn't know how, like what we're dealing with. We wouldn't know if this is a caterpillar or a grasshopper. We just, you won't know until you, you take a look. Now this final picture is a photo of hopper burn, which is a symptom of potato leaf hopper damage. Now hopper burn, plants that exhibit hopper burn have leaves that tend to kind of do this. They fold in on themselves and become almost like tubular. And leaves can also turn yellow or brown as a result of potato of hopper burn. So this is a good indicator of potato leaf hopper feeding. Now, if you're ever unsure about what you're seeing, take a sample or a photo and send it to the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. This is an excellent resource if you're not sure what you're seeing. You know, is this disease or is this nutritional or is this a is this a, an insect related problem? Uh, it's a great resource if you're not sure what you're seeing. I will say though. It costs the same amount to send a sample as it does to send a photo. And so that's just something I wanted to point out. Now we've talked a lot about pests. Let's talk about predators. Oh, oh, that was weird. Okay. Oh, pests. Let's talk about predators. So not every insect is out to eat your plants. These insects, a lot of insects are predatory. And all of the insects that I'm about to go over feed on uh, soft-bodied insects, such as aphids, white flies, leafhoppers, uh, as well as insect eggs. Uh, and it's important to differentiate the different uh, life stages of these insects. 
So for example, lady beetle larvae are voracious predators, but, and they kind of look like these weird alien face hugger things. Uh, they're, they're black with these white stripes, with these uh, spots on either side, and they are voracious predators as well. So are lady beetle adults. Um, these are great plants. These are great insects to have around. Lacewings, on the other hand, have a slightly different life cycle where uh, lacewing larvae look a little bit more beige. And if you look at them up close, they look like these little alligator things. Uh, and they're also very voracious predators of soft-bodied insects. However, lacewing adults are not predators at all. In fact, they feed on pollen and sometimes actually on honeydew, but they're great to have around because if they're on your fields, they might be laying eggs on your plants. And that's great. Anyway, so there are other predators that we observe very commonly. Um, Long-legged flies were among the most common uh, predators that we observe. And again, they feed on soft-bodied insects as well as minute pirate bugs. And they're not called minute out of irony. That, that's a human thumb and it's small even in comparison to the fingernail. So these insects are very use, very good to have around. Now, long-legged flies are these green iridescent flies. They look almost like they're walking on stilts. Uh, they, they, as the name suggests, they have very long legs. Um, uh, and in terms of how we observe these insects through the season, so in terms of seasonal observations, so in June, we kind of have a similar pattern just overall. In June, we have our lowest number of predator observations, which then for the most part peak in July and decline uh, as we move into August. And the most abundant groups of most commonly observed predators that we found were lace wings, long-legged flies, hoverflies, uh, and lady beetles. Those were the most common things that we observed through the season. Yeah, that's essential. Oh, and also I will say you will also you can also expect to see uh, soldier beetles earlier in the season. Uh, these are predatory insects. They're great to have around, um, but we didn't really see them that off. We didn't really see them much moving into July and August. And so now we can move on to likely visitors. So what do we likely visitors? Some insects aren't doing anything. They're just kind of hanging out. So in our case, these are again like things like flies, fruit flies, house flies, stuff like that, as well as on a few occasions, we observed June beetles uh, just hanging out, chilling out on the plants. And a surprise visitor for us is Japanese beetles. Now, Japanese beetles are herbivorous. They do eat plants, but we have not, we have not observed Japanese beetle feeding. Uh, we did not observe Japanese beetle feeding last season. So, and we also actually only observed Japanese beetles, I want to say four or five times through the entire season. So, Really, they are, we, we would classify them as visitors. So I gave you a lot of charts to talk about seasonality and I, let's talk about seasonal timing, but I think this is actually more informative. Uh, this is basically just a breakdown, a diagram and a breakdown of what we saw when. So earlier in the season, uh, I will also highlight that the yellow bars indicate potential pests and the green bars indicate uh, predators. So in earlier in the season, in terms of potential pests, it was mostly flea beetles and leaf hoppers, and it wasn't really until uh, late June that we started to observe white flies. Uh, and then as we moved into August, cannabis aphids and caterpillars made themselves apparent. And as and later in the season, plant bugs such as tarnished plant bugs and honestly even uh, stink bugs made themselves more apparent. Now in terms of predators, predator populations. Some, sometimes follow pest populations. Uh, so we didn't really see much in terms of predators from June to July. In the month of June, we didn't really see much. It was a lot of spiders. But as we moved from July to August, you know, we, we observed a much more diverse group of predators being present at our sites. And in terms of take-home messages, what I want you all to walk away with is we observed a, a wide diversity of insects on hemp plants through the season, but again, not all were insect were hemp feeders, potential pests, beneficials, predators, and likely visitors. And and while and observations did peak around July, including observations of potential pests and predators. Um, and as a, but it's also important. But even sorry, even though uh, observations peaked in July, it is really important to scout throughout the season so that you can recognize key insect groups, you can identify pest problem, potential pest issues before they become major problems. 
And it's important to become familiar with the signs and symptoms of insect damage. Now, again, if you're not sure about what you're seeing or what to do, uh, reach out to specialists at Purdue for help uh, diagnosing injuries or for, even for recommendations in terms of pest management. For and I would love, I really want to thank uh, the Long Lab members, my fellow graduate students, Emily Justice and Lila Kong, as well as our undergraduate researchers, Megan Jerky, uh, Fiona Gillen and Elliot Masterson, uh, as well as Elizabeth Long, who really helped put this all together. And I would like to thank um, uh, the Purdue Axie uh, for funding this project. Uh, with that, I will take, you're gonna have, yeah, I'll take Oops. any questions. <laughs> Uh, and that's my contact info, as well as Dr. Long's contact info, our website, and uh, the, the website, a link to the Purdue Pest and Plant Diagnostic Lab. So with that, I will take any questions. Can you describe the growing season? Would you expect to see different pests in future years? Hmm. Describe the growing season. It was hot. It was a relatively hot and dry growing season last summer. Was it uh, dry, though? <laughs> Yeah, was it? Uh, it was humid. It was really sure. rainy. Yeah, rainy towards the early. Mm -hmm. Rainy toward, uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, well, yeah, I would say it was kind of a mixture between like off and on rain. Uh, would I expect to see different pests in future years? That's kind of a tricky one. Uh, I would expect to see a similar cast of characters. Essentially, I would, I, I might, I would not expect, but I might, I might think that, uh, I might think that the, 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 the levels of which we observed different things might change moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, that, I hope that answers your question. I think something you might add, Zach, that I know we've talked about with others, um, you mentioned that one of the sites was surrounded by corn. So that might be something that would influence Oh, absolutely. As well, like another, our, one of our sites was completely surrounded by corn and another one of our sites had cover crops growing in between each row. And you, in, I would expect if we went back to even, the, if we went back to that same plot that had the cover crops next year and there weren't any cover crops, we might expect to see uh, differences in the insects that we've observed. Mm -hmm. uh, Looks like do we know if any oh, of these insects are potential plant pathogen vectors? Hmm. I do not know that. Uh, I uh, I know that white fly that white flies can be thought to transmit hemp streak virus, but that's not been confirmed. Um. Uh, oh yeah, as well like uh, piercing sucking insects generally, you know, they're. I mean, I guess it's not a pathogen, but it's they can they can very easily cause sooty mold infections things like that. Um, but in terms of vectoring plant diseases, I'm not, I don't, I don't know if any of these insects are for sure plant pathogen, at least in, in the context of hemp. Okay. looks like there's another question. Do you recommend trap crops? <clears throat> and I'm wondering, um, if, um, Maximiliano, um, if you are mean like just general trap cropping or um, use of particular trap crops, but I'll invite you to weigh in on that, Zach. Hmm. Do I recommend trap crops? Well, in the fields that we've scouted so far, we have not, I, I personally have not seen any major pest damage. I have not seen anything where I was like, wow, that's a, that's really intense. And so I'm not, uh, based on what I've seen, I don't know if a trap crop would be warranted. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Just because we're not, I have not seen anything that I'm like, wow, that plant's destroyed. Like we're having real pest problems, like major things. Like for the most part, what I've seen is a lot of minor damage that the plants can kind of tolerate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I, I guess I would add to that, that at least in a field setting, um, a lot of these insects on hemp, I, I'm sure folks have looked into it. I'm not familiar with if they've looked specifically at important hemp potential pests, like in their relationship or preference for other plants that you might plant, like either between rows or on the edges. Um, although in a greenhouse setting, um, 
might be a little bit different. I know folks have done work with, I think the, the one I'm most familiar with are mites and beans, certain types of beans. So you can put, for example, bean plants in your uh, greenhouse setting or something. And then when the mites show up, they go to the beans first because they love them. And so you can kind of use that as a sentinel or trap crop. Although I guess it's technically not a trap crop in that way, but it would be a way for you to see that they're there. So hopefully that answers the question um, for Max. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, Mike Halsema is asking, were there more beneficial insects where there were cover crops versus none? Ah, okay. So overall in our, our site that had cover crops had our lowest number of insect observations across all of our three sites. And I, I can't expressly attribute that to the cover crop, but it is definitely possible that that cover crop is pulling a lot of both pests and predators away from your hemp. Mm -hmm. um, Could you describe a little bit what those um, cover crops were? Yeah, I, one of them was like a wheat sorghum combination with one other plant. There was a few brassicas like mustard, wild mustards and things like that. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact yeah. combinations. I think there was some sunflower in there too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and these were all grown in like combinations of threes, if I remember. It was three different types of cover crops per, per row. Uh, so yeah, that's essential. That's, that's, yeah, sorry. I don't, I, my memory's a little shoddy on exactly what we're in between the rows. No, I think that's a good answer though. And I mean, honestly, us being out there every two weeks, you, there were definitely, there was a lot of insect activity in oh, those yeah. cover crops. I mean, especially when they were flowering, like the bees, there were tons of bees in there. So as just following up on what you said, Zach, I think that, you know, it, it is possible, even though we didn't actually count every, you know, every insect, but it's possible that they were, you know, in that cover crop and they were like, this is where we want to be. This is where the goods are, you know, hemp yeah. is interesting to us, but not as much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, mentioned caterpillars. Did I see any hemp or larvae? Mm. No, no, I didn't. I didn't see any hemp or larvae or any corn earworm damage. I didn't see anything that would be similar to that. No. Based on um, our understanding of, of the life cycle or kind of when these caterpillars would show up, do you think we might have seen them, Zach, if we had scouted longer? It's possible. I mean, yeah, it's definitely possible. Uh, but at the same time, you know, in the year prior, in 2020, we scouted uh, another hemp plot at Mix Research Farm uh, up until late September, like mid September. And even then, I didn't really see any uh, hemp borers or corn earworm damage. So it's definitely possible, but I haven't seen it. Oh, I guess Mike has. Yeah. Some boring beetle damage. Okay. And this is helpful, like as part of the discussion um, for folks here, because where you are and what you're seeing, maybe also your, um, like if you have hemp in the same place year after year, um, you, you know, it's, it's interesting to share those observations. So that's interesting. You saw the boring beetle uh, damage. I have to say, I was disappointed. We didn't see more boring in the buds, but that's uncool of me to say. <laughs> I mean, as somebody who's interested in growing and doesn't want those caterpillars, but I was surprised as well. I was expecting to see something. Yeah, same. Especially because like corn earworm is considered like a major pest of hemp in a lot of states. And I have not seen corn earworm damage. I know that it has been seen in Indiana, uh, but I have not personally seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today's the one day Marguerite, our uh, hemp extension specialist, couldn't join us today, but I'm sure she could give us more insight about the the borer damage uh, or corn earworm and because one of the sites or the previous year the hemp that that you scouted Zach that was sweet corn was in the vicinity so it's yes. interesting that it wasn't seen yeah yeah I don't know though we weren't really looking know, but it, it's yeah. interesting <laughs> it could have been down yeah it's, it's very interesting okay well we're right at 12 31 um if there's any final questions, we welcome them. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all for joining us for 30 minutes during your lunch hour to learn about um, uh, insects in hemp. And um, please, I just wanna remind you all to complete that survey um, if you haven't already. And please join us next week um, 
for the third uh, session of this uh, hemp IPM webinar series, and that will be focused on pesticide use in hemp. And Sarah Caffrey will be giving us an update. Um, and she's with the Office of the Indiana State Chemist. So looking forward to see all, seeing all of you again next week. And um, I'm going to linger a little bit for those of you who may uh, still need that link for the survey. But thank you all for joining and um, hope to see you next Tuesday for the next session.